But Hebrews takes so many of these Old Testament rituals and explains what they mean today. And how many know they were just lessons back then of the real thing that we would have? By that high priest going into that holiest of holies, that was just a foreshadow that Jesus, the real high priest, is going to go into heaven one day and he's going to atone for our sins. And so the because our sins were separating us from God, they were making us repulsive to God. When those sins were atoned for, there was nothing between us and God anymore. So he could give us that power to do what Jesus did. And notice Jesus was doing those things as a man. And, and there needs to be a lot of teaching about this because like these people are thinking, we can't do what Jesus did. Well, he did them when he was like a man. So he was trying to tell us, yes, you can do what I'm doing. In other words, he, he not only, how many know he came down to die for us? He couldn't die as God, right? God can't die. So the only way he could die for us and the only way there could be a sinless person to die, I mean, it's no good if somebody has sin and they die for us. They've got to die for their own sins. You know, they can't die for us. But God came down, no sin, so he could die for us. And number two, before he would die, he would say, by the way, everything I'm going to do is what you can do once you're saved. These things shall you do because I'm going to the Father. And so he as a man did those things because we as mankind uh, can do them. And he was given this example. And so it's just so wonderful that we, are, we see this in the word when people don't even know about that. But anyhow, let's get into this issue. We're going to continue with Esther. Last week we talked about how Esther made the enemy's law ineffective. And remember... Well, I'll show you those verses. We'll begin where we left off. So before we get into the introduction of scripture, we see that Esther found out that the law that Haman set up to kill the Jews couldn't even be revoked by the king. Because remember, the king sealed it with his name, with his ring. His ring had a signet on it, his name. And, and once that was done, not even the king can go against it. And they would be able to get rid of the king and get another one if he tried. So Esther said, okay, this law that Haman started was sealed with the king's ring, so we can't do anything about the law. But she learned that I did all I need to do, Esther. The hanging occurred. Somebody say the cross occurred. The cross. That's how they hang people. Remember, they didn't hang them by the neck. They hanged them up by their arms. Remember that picture I showed you that y'all thought it was Jesus being crucified and it turned out it was a painting of Haman being hanged from the Middle Ages? And so the hanging was done. And, and the king gave Haman's house to her. And then she gave it to Mordecai. So she realized now she needs to do something. See, most Christians, that's why they're defeated. They, they never do anything. They think it's all supposed to be an automatic victory. And they wonder, okay, how come I'm, I'm losing? How come I'm struggling? Um, we rise up against things. It's not automatic. We've got power. And, and the Bible says there's certain things you have to do or you will struggle. You will struggle. I still don't know where Beelzebub fits in in that, but I had something in my mind. But what we're seeing here in Esther, when she gets to this place where the king says, I, I, I'm not doing anything else. You take my name now and you make a decree. So we're starting to see where Christians, it's not just automatic you have victory. You have to stand up and state it and claim it and decree it in the name of the king, in Jesus' name. And so that's a lesson that Esther's showing that so many Christians know nothing about. But it's right there in Esther. So I, last week I talked about how Esther made the enemy's law ineffective. Now I'm going to show you how we apply that, how we make the law. I'm going to show you what that law that Haman started represents in the New Testament. We know it represents something, right? But we've got to lay out exactly what it means. So, again, she touched the scepter of the kingdom. She came into contact with power. In other words, when you touch something, you contact it. She came into contact with power. You will come into contact and power when you can get into that holiest of holies. But you're not going to get it. You know, it's like God was showing me this too. 
My, it's just God's showing so much about this. That um, when you're praying to God and you don't think you're good enough, like you don't have a revelation that the cross made you, like again, according to that sign, I'm so glad Lissy put that up. Jesus Christ did what makes God happy with you. You don't do what makes God happy with you. Jesus already did what makes him happy to you, for you. And, and so when you really understand that, you say, well, it's not my behavior. It's not my goodness. It's what he did on the cross, so I'm going on in. Then when you pray like that with boldness, I'm righteous. I'm, I'm right in the eyes of God. Then God sees you going into the holiest, and he answers you. But when you don't pray like that and you're doubtful of yourself, God looks at you like you're not even coming into the holiest to me. And how I many know oh, God hears us? He hears us. But it's like he's not hearing you because you don't have faith. You don't have faith that what the cross did made you righteous. You got something in your head that you have to do something to make you righteous. That, well, why am I doing this? I must not be righteous. Because you got to forget about what you're doing. And you got to understand you're not righteous by your good deeds. You're righteous by the work of the cross. And your behavior might, ha might need improvement. How many know what I'm saying when I say your behavior might need to be fixed up, but you are still righteous? You get it? They, they call it your standing or your position versus your behavior. My standing is perfect with God because of the cross, but my behavior is not. And so where we make a mistake is we look at our behavior and say, well, look, my standing can't be good because look at my behavior. See, there, you got to see the difference there. Your standing is right because the cross made you righteous. You're not made righteous by what you do in your behavior. So now... God will begin working on your behavior next, but first you got to see that your standing's good. And, and then that's why I've been preaching so much. The cross, the cross. He made you righteous. Some people don't ever get a revelation of that. How many really get a revelation of that? It's not, you know, when, when you get over this hurdle, I'm not good enough, I'm not good enough, look what I do. When you get over that and you realize, He made me righteous doesn't matter what I'm doing. He still made me righteous. Then you have gotten to the first revelation you need to get. And then that will lead you to the second one. And I'm going to show you the second one is now we're going to deal with your behavior. Now we're going to conquer these sins that you're committing. And that's what it has to do with where we make the law. So let's look at this. Eight, Esther 8 and 9. Then were the king's scribes called at that time in the third month that is the month Sivan, on the 3 and 20th day thereof, and it was written. Everybody say it was written. There's a new law being done now. There's a new decree. It was written according to all Mordecai commanded the Jews. And remember, Mordecai represents Paul the Apostle. He's trying to teach us. He's trying to teach the Jews. And to the lieutenants, the deputies, the rulers, look, from India to Ethiopia, 127 provinces, every province, these letters went everywhere. And in verse 10, he wrote in the king Ahasuerus's name and sealed it with the king's ring and sent letters. And that's just like Paul the Apostle. He wrote letters and sent them and it went everywhere. And we've got them here in, in, in Sydney. And they went on horseback, they went on mules and camels and dromedaries. We've got them on CDs, they've come by plane, they come from ship over the internet. Paul's letters are gone. And, and so he wrote in the name of the Lord, just like Mordecai did. And Esther says in verse 11, wherein the king granted the Jews which were in every city to gather themselves together and stand for their life. Don't just sit there. Rise up and take that letter that was written in the name of the king and do something. And then that's when my wife was sick with that headache this morning, a migraine. I rose up and I did something in the name of the king. And the headache went. And she's just recovering now. And so he says, destroy, slay, cause to perish all the power of the people and province that would assault them. That's what we need to do with these things that attack us. And I'm not just talking about sickness, but even these lusts in our own flesh that are trying to kill us. 
I'm going to show you where Paul actually used the word kill. He actually used the same word by these sins that we commit. It's killing our testimony. It's we're still righteous. The hanging still happened. Haman is gone. But there's a struggle that we have to deal with this law. And so he says, all the power of the people in the provinces that would assault them, both little ones and women, to take the spoil of them for a prey upon one day in all the provinces of the king Ahasuerus, namely upon the 13th day of the 12th month, which is a month later. That's the very day Haman said they should die. So they said, okay, if we're supposed to die on that day, then we, we have a higher law. We're making a law that will make his law ineffective. And this gave them authority to fight back. Jesus gave us authority over all the works of the devil. I mean, kids can do this. They can pray in Jesus. You can do it. You can pray in Jesus' name and command sickness to be healed. All of us can. So Paul, like Haman, being hanged, Paul says there's been a crucifixion. Look in Romans 6 and 6, knowing this. that Now look what he says about the cross. I don't know how many Christians know this verse. Hardly any. They read it, but they don't get it. Look what he talks about, about the cross. Our old man is crucified with him. It wasn't just Jesus that died. Our old man was crucified with him. Why? And it gives us the answer. So that the body of sin might be destroyed. Why? So that Henceforth, we should not serve sin. That's why Jesus died on the cross, to give us victory over sin. Yes, he died for us to save us from sin. Yes, he died for us so we don't have to go to hell. But he also died for us that before we end up going to heaven, before we leave this life, right now, we don't have to serve sin. When sin tempts me to curse and swear, when tin, t uh, sin rather tempts me to be jealous and hate, where sin tempts me to just be so angry with people, like Jesus said, if you hate somebody without a cause, you're worse than a murderer. Or you lust after somebody in your heart, in God's eyes, you committed adultery, even though the, fat, the behavior didn't do it. You're, you're, it was in your heart. All of these things, we don't have to serve that trash. We don't have to let those things rule us and commit sins. So that serving sin is what the New Testament calls the struggle that Christians face after they're saved, after the cross, after Haman was dead. There was still this law that was going to kill the Jews. And Paul calls it dying when you commit these sins. Your Christianity is being killed. You have to get victory. Now, you can repent and God will forgive you. And how many know he forgives? So you're good again. You're back on track. But you might sin again. And, and one person even told me, Mike, we're never going to have any more victory in this life than when we sin, we can ask forgiveness. That's the only bit. Forget about what you're thinking, that we can actually stop these things from happening. You, you, we don't have that much victory, he said. He's a liar. Because Paul said right there, sin shall not have Dominion. You will not serve sin anymore. That's why we were crucified with Jesus. So Haman died, but a law still existed that was going to kill the Jews. Just like the cross occurred and the devil was destroyed, but there's still a struggle Christians have. So watch how Paul refers to this threat of being slain after the crucifixion occurs. And he, called, he actually called it a law. That's why Esther so perfectly foreshadows this stuff. But you know, we were talking about a lot of people don't even see that in the book of Esther. They don't even think Esther should be in the Bible. You know why I think that's so? Because for one thing, they don't even know what Paul taught about the law of sin. They don't even know that Paul taught victory. So how are they ever going to see that in the book of Esther if they don't even know about it anyway? You know, they don't know what Romans teaches. So you have to study it. You have to be taught. And so Paul actually said that there's a law that you will face as a Christian that will make you struggle, and he calls it, that law will slay you. And here it is, Romans 7, verse 8. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment. What's he mean by the commandment? The law of Moses, right? The Old Testament law. T commandments, Ten Commandments, commandments contained in ordinances. It's law. 
And he says it wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. And remember I told you that when you bar mitzvah, when a Jewish boy became 12, he was all of a sudden responsible to keep the law. And now he, his father said, when you lied, it wasn't a big deal because you weren't 12 years old yet. You, weren't you didn't come to the age of understanding. But now that you're at the age of understanding, you can't lie. The commandment of God, the judgment of God will come on you if you do that. And so Paul, people, scholars say that what he's referring to here is, I was alive without the law once. That meant before he was 12 years old. He didn't have thou shalt not on his shoulders. So he says, I was alive, I was alive. But when the commandment came, when I became responsible and God said thou shalt not and I had to not, then sin revived and I died. Everybody say, I died. Now, he didn't die physically, because he wouldn't be writing if he died physically, right? But he called it, when sin would make him commit sin, he called that dying. And that is what the law that Haman started that would kill the Jews represents. Now, it's not the law of Moses, it's not the Old Testament law that was killing him. It was sin taking occasion by the law. It's like this. If there was a knife laying here and I was a murderer, I could take advantage of that law, that knife. I could take occasion by that knife and kill somebody. But how many know that's not the knife? It's the one using the knife. Well, that's like what Paul was saying. It's not the law that's bad. But sin used the law like a dagger and killed Paul with it. And how did it happen? When the law came, Paul said, sin revived, and I died. That meant, and that's what it means, like when anybody ever tells you, don't you do this, something rises up in you and makes you want to do it. You know what that something is? It's sin, and it's in your own flesh. Sin will rise up, and it'll take occasion by what that person just commanded you, and it'll kill you by making you do wrong. It's the, what the person said wasn't bad. It was good. How many know it's good? When a parent tells a child, don't do it. That's good for the child. But something in that child rises up and it takes that commandment that was just given to it and kills that child by making him want to. That's what the Bible calls being slain. Everybody see that? Let's, let's keep going. It's like us trying to serve God and we're committing sins instead. It kills our testimony. It kills our victory. So picture your defeats like Haman's law killing you. That law is going to kill us all, Esther. Mordecai said, we're still going to die. We've got to stop that law from killing our people. And so the commandment, that's referring to the Old Testament, the list of do's and don'ts. It said, in the Old Testament, you know how you live for God? You live by willpower. Thou shalt not lie. Okay i got to make myself not lie. That's willpower. You're using the power of your will. How many know you're not asking God to help you? You're just saying, I've got to make myself not lie. That is Old Testament. That's the difference between the Old Testament and the New. The New Testament's not like that. But you know what a lot of Christians do? They make the New Testament like the commandments. Oh, the Bible says you're supposed to love one another. Okay, I'm going to make myself love one another. I'm going to make myself love. That's not what he's meaning. You get the Spirit of God to cause you to love people. And if you're just going to read the New Testament and make yourself do what it says, you might as well be under the law and under the commandments. Because you're not seeing the difference at all. You've just twisted the whole New Testament. Let me explain it some more. The Old Testament said, don't do this and do this. And it instructed the Jews to use their willpower and make themselves obey the law. Here it is in Leviticus 18 and 5. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man do. Everybody say, if a man do. If you do it, if you keep these commands, he shall live. He shall live in them. When you keep it, you're, you're going to live. And in Galatians 3 and 12 describes that. He takes that very verse in Leviticus 18 and 5, and he says, the law is not of faith, but, and then he quotes Leviticus, 
the man that doeth them shall live in them. There's no faith in that. You do it and you'll live. You do it and you'll live. How many know if we believe, we'll have everlasting life? Not if we do, we'll live. If we believe, see? And, and you can see now, I hope you can see more easily, that people that think, I'm not good enough because I'm not doing this right. You, you, don't, you, get, you don't get it. You're still under law. You twisted the New Testament. You, you don't know. It's believing that makes you righteous, not what you do. It's believing that Jesus said, he, whosoever believeth in him should have everlasting life. But in the Old Testament, it wasn't like that. Whosoever doeth these things, he shall live. Are you catching it? Now you can see a lot of Christians are legalists. They're under law. They don't have the revelation. <laughs> They'd never go into the holiest like Esther did. Because they keep looking at themselves. I'm not good enough. I'm not going in there. But when we say, Jesus did what makes God happy with me. So I can go in. It's not me making myself. I can work my knuckles to the bones and still not be good enough. So Mordecai. His law, Mordecai under the law, said you cannot worship a man. So when Haman came by and everybody was bound, Mordecai couldn't bow. He had to serve God. He, the commandment said don't worship anybody but God. So ha Mordecai would not bow to Haman. And Haman took advantage of that and said now he's going to die. Remember Daniel? He would pray every day, morning, noon, and night. He'd open the window up. And then they got jealous of him and they wanted him dead. So they took advantage of Daniel's law from God and said, King, every time somebody prays to somebody else other than you for these certain amount of days, they should die. See how these crooked men took occasion by the law of God and wanted to slay Daniel? Haman took occasion of Mordecai's law from God and wanted to slay him. Well, by the same token, sin takes occasion by the commandment and slays us. See how Esther so perfectly fits what Paul is teaching? And so, sin is stronger than willpower, though. See, the law says you have to use willpower to serve God because you have to make yourself do and make yourself don't. And Paul said, I tried that. I, when the commandment came, I tried to make myself do right. But sin put all kind of concupiscence, which means wicked thoughts in my mind. And the more I tried to be good and obey law, the more sin made me die. The more it stabbed and stabbed. The harder I tried to serve God, the deeper the knife went in. And he says it's not the knife. It's that miserable sin that's taking occasion of that knife. The knife is the law. There's nothing wrong about it. How I many know we need knives? We do good things with knives, right? But you get the knife in the hand of somebody that's wrong and evil, and it'll do bad. And that's it. Don't ever say the law of God's bad because it told people to keep commandments. It wasn't bad. It was right. But it's like we can't keep a law when we have sin on us. There's got to be another solution to deal with sin than law. Law would be good if people didn't have sin in them. But because they have sin in them, there's a Haman in them called sin. And that Haman, Haman's law, I should say, Haman's law. Haman's law rises up and makes you die the harder you try to keep a commandment of God. And, and that sin in us is stronger than our willpower. So our willpower says, I've got to make myself do good. But there's something in you called sin that's stronger than willpower. And watch, Paul actually said, I've got the willpower. But it's not strong enough. I keep committing sin. In Romans 7 and 15. For that which I do. He said the bad things I'm doing. I allow not. I don't want this. I don't allow this. I, I, this is wrong. For what I would. In other words the good things I want to do. I do not. But what I hate. That I do. And then in verse 18, he says, I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing, for to will is present with me. Somebody say, he had the willpower. To will, I want, how many know, 
Paul wanted to do good. And have you ever been like that? You want to do good? You don't want to hurt somebody with your words, but did you ever do it anyway? Huh? You, you don't want to maybe lust after something, but you do it anyway? Because something's pushing you to do it and you can't resist it? Your willpower that's present with you isn't strong enough to stop you. And that's why the Old Testament doesn't work. Because it makes us use willpower, but there's sin in us that is stronger than our willpower. So that's why he says, to will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good? I find not. I can't find the power. I, my willpower isn't enough. And so don't ever believe that nonsense where there's a will, there's a way. Huh? Can you see now how that's wrong? Well, there's a will, there's a way. No. Paul wouldn't have wrote what he did if that was true. He had the will. How many say there was a will? But how to perform that? Which, in other words, the way? It wasn't there. So sin is in all of us, and it's in your flesh, and it's in mine. And just like in the land of Syria, there was a law that Haman started that was present inside of us. There's sin. Haman was already hanged. The cross already took place. But the law was still there. And the law is still in you, and it's in me as a Christian. It's the law of sin and death. And if we are going to try to serve God by commandments using willpower, that law of sin and death is going to beat us every time. It's going to beat us every I, I described it like our willpower is like a little baby's hand that tries to take his other hand and move it to do good, but then an arm wrestler's hand comes called sin and makes it do wrong. Who do you think is going to win? The little baby's hand or the arm wrestler's hand? That's what force of sin is compared to our willpower. So we need something stronger than sin. Amen? And it's not your willpower. The Jews were going to die because Haman hated them since they weren't bowing down. And like the, Daniel, remember the three Hebrew children? They wouldn't bow either. At the sound of the psaltery, at the sound of the music, everybody bowed. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, we're not bowing. And they hated them for keeping the law of God. They took occasion by the commandment of God and made them go into the fire and die. But what happened when Daniel went into the lion's den for refusing to stop praying? What happened when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were threatened to die, but they held on anyway? God rescued them, right? That's exactly what God's trying to tell us. He will rescue us. But you've got to go past willpower and lock onto God's power. Because that arm wrestling hand might be bigger than an infant's hand of our willpower. But God's hand is stronger than any hand of a wrestler. And God is the only one that has the power to destroy that sin. To defeat that law. We can't do it on our own. But when you are trying to run your own life, you're trying to do what you think you should do. You're not trusting in God to work things out. P too many Christians are acting independent of God. They want to do what they want to do. They don't think, God, what's your will? What's your will, God? I mean, they not only not depend on him to give them strength to deal with sin, but they don't even depend on him to give them direction. They just... They're in control, and they can't stand not being in control. That's independence from God, and Satan works with that stuff. You see, Satan told Eve, you be God, you be God. Just know what's good and know what's evil, and make yourself do the good and make yourself avoid the evil. You don't need him. Do it yourself. And so God says, everybody that wants to run their own shows... They're opening the door for the devil because the devil started that stuff. So the more, it's like James said, don't say tomorrow I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that. Say if the Lord wills, I will do this. See, he's trying to get it into our heads, into our blood, into our very thinking, like it's instinct to us. What's God want? What's God? He's trying to make us depend on the power of God because that's where we went wrong in the garden. We stopped depending on the power of God when Adam and Eve said, we're going to take knowledge of good and evil and we're going to do what we think we should and we're going to make ourselves do good. 
And so, these laws are made all through these stories in the Old Testament to kill believers in God that are trying to obey God. But God stepped in every time. Praise God. And you know what it is? The Old Testament said, you've got to make yourself do this. But God stepped in with the New Testament. And he says, trust in me. Stop trying to make yourself good by doing. Make yourself believe. Cause yourself to believe that I am already good by what God did. Not what I do. It's not my behavior that saves me. It's his behavior when he worked on the cross. And depend on God. So Paul was thinking of this. I want to do good. But there's something inside me making me do wrong. The more I want to do good, the more this thing kills me. So look what he says in verse 21. I find then a law. Now, before verse 21, when he talked about law, what law was he talking about again? The law of Moses. Okay? But in verse 21, he finds another law. I find that a law. There's another law he realizes. It's like, wow, I didn't... Th now that I think of it, I'm, I just discovered something. I found that there's another law here. And here's what the law is. When I would do good, evil's present with me. Every time I do good, evil's there. In fact, the more I try to do good harder, the harder evil's there. How many know if you hit yourself against the wall, it'd hurt? How many know if you hit yourself harder against the wall, it hurt more? Well, that's just like this. The more you try to make yourself good, the harder sin is going to kill you right in return. So Paul, it hit him. He got a revelation. Oh my, he said, I got a revelation. I got a, when I would do good. It's not when I call on God, it's when I make myself do good. I is the problem. The more I try, the more I, try. he doesn't say when I call on God. He doesn't say when I have faith. He says when I would do good. Everybody say I. I is the problem. Over in Newfoundland, they say I is the by. <laughs> I'm the problem. When I would do good, when I use my willpower and I don't believe and I don't trust in God to help me, whenever I act on my own, evil's always present with me and it kills me. And so guess what? I found out the answer. It's like clockwork. How many know if I, if I pick my keys up, I don't care if I'm in Sydney, if I do this in Sydney, and that's what happens to my keys, how many know it's going to happen in Portage too? And if I'm in Japan, if I do this, it'll still fall, right? What law do they call that? Gravity. The law of gravity. You know why they call it the law of gravity? Because under the same conditions, it happens all the time. It's a law. When something happens, when you do the same thing, that makes it a law. And Paul said, it's a law. Every time it'll happen, when I make myself do good, evil's there. I blow it. And sin kills me. You can count on it every time. It's right there to work every time. It's like it actually kicks into effect when you use your willpower. When I try to make myself serve God, I'm, I'm, I'm turning on a power that I don't want to turn on. And it, it hurts me and it kills me. And it's, got to, it's me making myself do good that gives it the life. And he says... But that's what the Old Testament demanded. It told me I have to do to be good. It told me I have to use my willpower. The Old Testament said use willpower to serve God. However, now that we're saved by the cross, when our sin is washed away because Jesus died and we resurrected and we died with him, we're not just free from sin. We're free from the limitation of having to resort to willpower alone. We don't have to refer to flesh. We don't have to go to willpower to serve God, to make ourselves do good. We've got another avenue. Go back to Romans 7 and 4. Wherefore, my brethren, you also are become dead to the law. Jesus wasn't the only one that died. You also became dead. And you became dead to the law, the Mosaic, Mosaic Old Testament law. You don't have to serve God in the letter anymore by willpower. 
How did I become dead, Paul? You died by the body of Christ. Wasn't that what Romans 6 says? Our old man was crucified with him. So when that body of Jesus died on the cross, I died. And I not only died to sin, but I died to the Old Testament law. I don't have to keep that. That I should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruits unto God. How many know you should be bringing forth love in your life? You should be bringing forth joy and peace. But how come we're bringing forth works of the flesh instead of fruit of the Spirit? We should be bringing forth good things out of our lives. Jesus died so that we could be like his wife as the church, like the Esther, and have children for him. Children of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, and goodness. But sin is messing this up. And so he tells us as in verse 4 what we should be doing, and then he's going to explain how. First, you've got to know what you should be doing, right? And how many know everybody knows what they should be doing? I mean, you almost don't have to say it. But how? Preacher, tell me how. I know what I should be doing, but how? I will to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. Give me the how. And that's what Paul's gonna do. For when we were in the flesh, the motion of sins, that force of sin inside me, which were by the law, and it always used the Old Testament law, remember, it worked in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. Notice he said we should be bringing forth fruit unto God, but we're bringing forth fruit unto death. And that's because you're in the flesh. How many know you can serve God in the flesh? That means you're using willpower. You're trying to obey commandments. You twisted the New Testament all around. You're in the flesh. You're not supposed to serve God that way. But verse 6 says, Now we are delivered from the law, that being dead, wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not the oldness of the letter. In other words, oldness of the letter is commandments. Don't serve God by keeping commandments. Don't serve God by willpower, obeying rules. Too many Christians think church is rule keeping. Rule keeping means you use your willpower and you stop doing that. And I heard so many Christians say when somebody backslid, because they couldn't get victory over sin. Oh, they just didn't want to serve God. That's a lie. Because Paul said, I wanted to serve God, but I couldn't. That's why he said, to will is present with me. How many know when you will something, you want to do it? But how to perform that which is good? I don't know it. It's not present with me. I have the will. Don't tell me I don't want to serve God. I want to. I've got the will, but I don't know the how. And so Paul has to explain all this out to get to that how. So everybody say, there's two ways to serve God. One is an error. The other is the correct way. The error is serving in oldness of the letter. The correct way is serving in newness of spirit. Okay? So, only those who are saved can do this next point I'm going to make. We, somebody say save people, save. do not have to stick to the letter. We don't have to stick to one method. If you're not saved, you don't have that option. You don't have God's help. You don't have God's grace. But you know what the problem is? A lot of Christians have the option to serve in newness of spirit, but they don't know about it. No one's ever taught them. They weren't given that understanding. All they think of is, I've got to make myself serve God. And, and you know what? If you have a preacher that never teaches you this stuff, every one of you are going to think you've got to live by commandments because it's in your nature to do it. You need a teacher to explain to you there's another option. What? You mean I don't make myself do? No, there's another way. And, and Paul, oh, not enough people preach out of Romans. They don't know what it's talking about. I'm talking about preachers don't even know. But you know, other preachers, it's their ministry to teach. It might be another preacher's ministry to do something else. But the ministry of teaching needs to rise up just as much as the ministry of prophets. How many know we all like to see prophets? Oh, I want to go see a prophet. 
I want to see him. Thus saith the Lord. I want to see him perform miracles. Yeah, we need that. But bless God, we've been starving for the ministry of teaching. That's what's killing us. We don't know. A prophet can't explain that stuff. They don't have the revelation. They don't have the gift. An apostle can't. It needs to be somebody that's got this gifting. And Paul was an apostle and a teacher. And he says he taught. And so serving God by the oldness of letter is using willpower. It's willpower service. And you'll find out quickly it doesn't work. But we can serve in newness of spirit. And that's why we read in Romans 8 and 2. For the law of the spirit of life. Here's a third law Paul discovered. He, he, he didn't discover the law of Moses. He knew that. But when he was trying to keep the law of Moses, he discovered the law of sin and death. That every time I do good, evil's going to be there. The harder I try, the worse I get killed. The worse I fail. So then he says, but there's a third law, the law of the spirit of life. He said there's oldness of the letter versus newness of the what? Spirit, right? So the letter is the Moses law. The spirit is the New Testament law. It's not a commandment type law. It's a completely different thing. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from that law of sin. It made me free from Haman's law that was trying to kill me because I stopped making myself use willpower and every time I used willpower, sin would stop, kill me. So how do you stop it from killing me? Stop using willpower. And I'm, I'm now using spirit. I'm saying, God, I need your help. Woo! And, and call on God. Pull back from using your willpower and ask his hand to use your hand like an instrument of righteousness. That's what, I've got to go to Romans 6 and 13. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. Here's sin. Take my hands and make it slap, people. That's what we're doing when we're living by law. You, you're not wanting to do that, but that's what you're doing. You're putting your hand into the hand of sin, and it'll hurt. And it'll, you're putting your mouth, and you'll say things you don't want to say. That's the law of sin and death. He said, stop doing that. Yield, number one, yourselves unto God. And that's what Esther did first. Before anything else, she first presented herself to the king. But how many know you've got to have faith if you're going to do that? You've got to get over this works thing. Yet you're not good enough. Because you, God can't hear you pray in faith when you think you're not good enough. You're God. So get over that hump and present yourself to God first as somebody alive from the dead. Then number two, and your members. Now, go where Christians never even know about to go. Most of them aren't even going in to present themselves. I'm alive from the dead. They don't know they're alive from the dead. They don't even know what that means. What do you mean I'm alive? I didn't die. How, well, I can't understand Paul. He says to go in as I'm alive from the dead. That don't make any sense to me because they're not being taught. But how many know what you know? I resurrected with Jesus, so I'm alive from the dead. Now it makes sense. So once you get under that, then number two, now yield your members. That means your hands, your feet, your tongue, your mouth, your legs. God, these legs are going to take me places I don't want to go. If I try to make myself do good because sin will make them go somewhere I don't want to go. God, these hands are going to do things they shouldn't do because if I use willpower, sin is going to be stronger than my willpower and make me do wrong. So God, I'm not doing that anymore. I'm going to you. I not only present myself to you now, now I'm asking you. Here, take my hands. And he says, as instruments. Glenn had an instrument in his hand today. What could that instrument do unless it got into Glenn's hand? Nothing. Well, that's like us. Our instruments, our hands are instruments for him. But they're not in his hands. We're not giving them to him. We're trying to do it on our own. And they're doing nothing. In fact, well, I, I won't even say they're doing nothing. They're doing wrong. Because if you don't give them to God, sin is going to take them. And so, God, you take my hands. You take them and put them in your hands like an instrument. And when God takes your hands like an instrument, beautiful music happens. How many know that's a long way away from living by commandments? Did Moses ever say, ask God to use your hands today? Ask God. No, Moses said, thou shalt not lie. Thou shalt not murder. Don't make your hand kill anybody. He didn't say, 
give your hands to God like instruments. Because when you do it in your willpower, from your brain to your hand are going brain waves, signals. And you're making your hand do it, and that's very, very weak power. Because sin can say, oh yeah, you're going to do this instead. And you can have all the brain waves going to your hands you want, but they're not going to do anything. But when you say, God, take my hand, God comes down. And he grabs that arm of sin, and he throws it away. And he says, I'm going to cause you to walk in my statutes. I'm going to cause you to do good. You're workers together with me. You've been trying to work on your own. You missed that word together, though. You're workers together with me. You need to bring me on the scene. You haven't been doing that. You've been going to thou shalt nots and this and that. You haven't been following the law of the spirit. You've been following the oldness of the letter. Start calling on me for help now. Number one, realize I'm the only one that can do the work to make you holy. You can't do it. You're still messed up if you think you make yourself good enough for me. You don't get it at all. You'll never ask me to use your hands if you can't get past first base there. So I did the work to make you good. Accept that and come on into the holiest. And once you're there, give me your hands. Give me your feet. Give me your members as instruments of my righteousness. I am a gentleman. I will not make you do anything. It will never be automatic because I'm a gentleman. You have to give me in faith your body. And I will cause you. I will anoint you. I will inspire you. And you know what will happen? They that wait on the Lord. You see, you're not waiting on the Lord when thou shalt not. i got to stop. You're using willpower. Willpower is the opposite of waiting on the Lord. You wait on the Lord after you talk to him. God, use my hands. And then you wait on the Lord. And then God, who never gets weary, gives power to the faint. Somebody say, gives power. That's a big difference from you using your old power. Gives power to the faint. And they shall run and not be weary now. They shall run. After you wait on the Lord by faith. Okay, God's going to do it. God's going to do it. And don't doubt. If you doubt, you pop the balloon. You deflate it. Keep your faith. He's going to do it. He's going to do it. I've been praying for things lately. And when I pray, saying, God's going to answer me. He's going to answer I'm waiting on the Lord, and all of a sudden I feel the eagle's wings attach themselves to me. God's just given me power. I feel the eagle's wings mounting me up, and it's not natural. It's like oil, olive oil that's not natural to an almond tree. Its eagle's wings aren't natural to a human. But God's trying to show us these illustrations to say, it's not your natural power you need. That's what law tried you to do to make you do use natural power but I'm giving you my power and then we mount up and we rise above that lust we rise above that sin and we're doing the good that we want to do so the how you want to know what the how is pull back from your willpower stop trying to do this on your own and do what Romans 6 and 13 says Esther go into the inner court Mordecai saying Go in. Who wrote Romans 6 and 13? Paul. Didn't Mordecai tell Esther to go on in? Paul's telling you, go on in. Esther, bride, queen, go in there. And once you get in there, make your petition known. Here, God, I'm going to die. There's a law of sin and death that's going to kill us. And you know what the king says? You rise up, and in my name, you command. You see, we didn't know it, but we were commanding in our own name every, tried, every time we used willpower. But when you say in the name of Jesus, not just say it, but you know everything I've just told you this morning. When you say in the name of Jesus to your own lusts, stop working inside of me. God's anointing comes on you, strangles that lust, and you love instead. The how is Romans 6 and 13. Everybody say it. The how is Romans 6 and 13. Why did Paul say in chapter 7 how to perform a fun? He wrote that after he wrote chapter 6. How could the how? How could he give the... Because in chapter 7, he's showing you how he discovered that. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, man. That's, I have to stop there in a couple minutes afternoon. We started a little late anyway, but...